Hey guys, how are you? Welcome to the show. I have another special guest. As you all know, I love the guests that I um, asked to come on because I always see something super special in them and they're all uniquely different. But uh, I like to find people who have presented something that I see in them that I believe will really, really add value to you and make a difference in your life. So um, I've invited uh, Patrick Robertson on the show, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, he is the owner and founder of Momentous Building, and that's um, a, a construction company. But as you can see, I mean, Patrick's not an old man. You know, he's a young man, and he's, he's um, really done something that... Um, is pretty powerful. He's created his own business. And as you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I belong to um, Arate and 365 Driven. And in terms of that, I just want to say the way that I met Patrick is I met him through Arate, which anyone who doesn't know, it's a, um, it's a business entrepreneurship, networking, training, community run by Ed Milet and Andy Frisella. And what we do there is we um, learn how to be people of integrity in all areas of our business. But there, the mission of Arate is to be a force for good on earth as business owners. So they want to change the face of business to being something good across the world. So we have a very unique set of individuals who are able to get into this group. It's we're vetted pretty hard. And um, they ask us a lot of questions. I know originally when I went in, it was they it was brutal, like the questions they just asked so many questions. And it really I love it because what you end up extracting out of that community is just really high quality people, people who you can connect to who have a little bit of that entrepreneur weirdness, and like that drive that you don't typically see everywhere. So as you guys know, I'm all about crushing mediocrity and not falling into that automated pattern that we fall into where we just buy the lie that we just live a life that's just good enough. The reason that I have Patrick here is because Patrick is the farthest thing from that. Patrick is maybe a little too driven. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. But I just want you guys to hear what he has to say and how he's overcome different difficulties in his life to become where he is today. And keep an eye on him because you'll watch, you'll see how far he ends up going. So Patrick, welcome to the show. Allison Answers. Love having you. I'm going to ask you, can you just give us some background? You had given off camera, you had given me like some background about how you ended up where you are today. Could you just tell that story a little bit? And I'm going to interrupt and ask you questions. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And that was a great introduction. You know, quite frankly, I don't know if I deserve all that, but, but thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Um, but my story is, is really just, um, you know, I would say average, right? Uh, I'm nothing too great special. Um, I'm a third generation, um, you know, person that has been in construction. My great grandfather, my grandfather was in construction on both sides. My dad um, owns a residential construction. He's still construction company still to this day. And that's how I kind of got into the industry. You know, I was sitting on his lap on an excavator before I could, you know, walk. And then, you know, that led up until, you know, middle school, I was sweeping floors and it continued through there. I uh, got my engineering degree at college because, um, you know, I, I am blessed. My father was successful and is successful in his business. So uh, he, uh, he recommended that I go to get a college degree. There's no reason to rush into something, into a business that's going to be here if I want to come back to it. So that's what I did. I went and got my engineering degree and pursued actually commercial construction down in Manhattan. Worked for a great company called Structure Tone. And uh, wow, I learned a lot there. And uh, it was exciting, but ultimately I also learned that I didn't like working and being in Manhattan every single day. So during um, when the pandemic kind of broke out and we were you know, 
not working for a few months, I started, you know, helping out my father and realized that that was more of a lifestyle that I enjoyed. So I uh, went back into business with him for a couple of years and, you know, started to slowly take over a lot of roles and responsibilities to the point where I was pretty much running the company. And then, um, you know, family businesses have their challenges as uh, anyone that's been in them knows. So uh, we kind of started the butt heads and I decided to go in a different direction and uh, open up my own company. And that's kind of where we're all, we are today. How did your dad um, feel about you uh, branching off and doing it yourself? You know, <laughs> I have an extremely loving father, right? Awesome. So he didn't, he didn't have a problem with that. Um, he actually wanted me to stay and wanted to stay with the company, even though there was difficulties and you know, some light arguments and disagreements. Um, but at the end of the day, he was my father and, you know, he was never, you know, saying that I shouldn't or upset because I basically, I mean, there's no such thing as real competition, right? It depends on how you look at it, but I'm technically his competitor. I mean, if you want to look at it on paper, but so, but at the same time, he supported me and, and helped me, you know, and, and still to this day, he still gives advice if anything comes up on jobs. So the the thing I love the idea about you guys are competitors because I believe that I believe that as well. I don't think that we have competition. I think that there's enough for everyone, but mm -hmm. um, we can we can get lost in that a little bit. But especially you know having your your own your own kid, it doesn't matter. Like they could have what you have. I mean, he probably want would you know you would have had his business anyhow, like eventually, right? So yeah. So what do you like? What are your challenges? Like, wh where is your business at now? Because I want to get into your heart and like the things because I think that you um, I, I know that you're deep and that you've transformed internally um, mm -hmm. and you're continuing to as we all need to. Right. So how yeah. do you feel like you've like, have you been transforming? Like, have you did you have insecurities? Did you have fears? You know what? What comes up for you? Yeah. Um, I have a lot to be honest and I still yeah. do. And I've been working on a lot of them. I mean, insecurities, fears, you know, all the way from growing up. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> I had an amazing mother who cooked phenomenal food. I, uh, was a little overweight as a kid oh, and yeah. kids being kids, you know, I got picked on a little bit, a little more than a little bit, but you know, that was just growing up and I don't actually, I'm not upset about any of that because everything we go through in life, you know, I, I personally believe happens for a reason and it's actually made me to the person I am today. You know, that those kids picking on me, you know, kind of put this, you know, fire in me to be better, to get in shape, to lose some weight, right? When the time came and I realized everything. And with that, I kind of also realized how much, how capable I am, right? I was really never athletic growing up, but, you know, right now I could have a cold and still run, you know, a 630 mile. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, it's confidence through action, right? So, you know, that's kind of like, I got baggage, right? Like we all do. And I know people go through experiences in life that are, are far worse um, than I've ever been through. Um, so that, that kind of puts me where I'm at today. And, my mental baggage that I have carries through, you know, the common ideas of what a contractor is. I grew up in the industry around the blue collar workforce of this area in New York. So I hear the typical stories, um, the older contractors and how they feel and what they think everything is like, the majority of it. And a lot of it's negative, to be honest. So how I'm filled is it with negative? I, I have a, um, you know, you hear a lot right now, for example, you can't find guys. There's no good guys out there. No one wants to work. Oh, yeah. Common, common thing right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think that all the good workers from six years ago magically disappeared. Exactly. They're just that better companies. You know what? I'll tell you something that there's two things about what you just said. One is that um, I believe that if you believe 
that there are no good workers that can work for you, you won't have mm -hmm. any good workers work for you. And yeah. if you believe that no matter what, you will, you will draw to you great people because you, that's your expectation. It, and mm -hmm. you are the type of uh, employer who, first of all, will only take great people and who will treat people great. It, it just mm -hmm. creates that. They come out of the woodwork, the woodwork, you know? And so if there's a, the other thing is, is that what you were saying, oh, I have a few things I have to say to you. One is that um, about your um, being picked on, you know, we, we did a whole podcast with uh, Danielle Madonna and she talked about being picked on in, in school and mm -hmm. how it really affected her in her life and um, how the voices still come up. You know, it doesn't matter how great she is now, like the, you know, that wiring, just being in there and having mm -hmm. to pivot away from it regularly, you know, to, to advance, you know, when just even being in a new environment, like, or being in front of food or whatever, being in front of a mirror. And um, I think that I see a lot with a lot of really super successful people, I think Oh, maybe most, um, we've had like pretty heavy challenges in our lives. And you come saying, oh, people have had it harder than you. You know what? People have, people, no matter how bad you've had it, somebody has had it harder. However, it doesn't mean that your challenge is, wasn't a challenge, right? It's a, mm -hmm. and it's also a catalyst, right? Like what you were saying. Yeah. So do you ever still think like, does it, do you still get insecure? Cause you're, you're fit. I mean, you can't really say like, can't fully see, but he is fit <laughs> AF. Like he's super fit, this guy. So like, you know, I don't think you have any body fat. Do you? Me? No, I'm probably, I'm probably sitting right now around 10 or 11. Oh, um, it's deceptive. It's, it's deceptive, right? Because being overweight as a kid, and my genetics, a lot of it sits around my midsection and my love handles. So I'm like tank top, super lean. Um, but hey, listen, that's nothing to complain about. Wait, you know? wait a second. I said you have no body fat. I didn't mean you really had none. 10% is no body fat. <laughs> right? No? I mean, isn't that true? All right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's humble. Okay. Do you ever get insecure? <laughs> about uh about yourself yeah i mean i think that you know we always throughout our entire lives are going to have the stories that you know that that cause trauma in our lives right and i don't mean to we all go through things in our lives and i said mine's not worse than it you know as some people's mm -hmm. but the idea of a rock bottom and what that is it's a mental perception of it so just because my rock bottom wasn't as far as yours doesn't mean it it triggered an awake moment right where i need to get my life together mm -hmm. some people have to be some alcoholics have to lose every single thing right mm -hmm. and then some people just have to get arrested one time for drinking yeah. which i did and that's mm -hmm. that, that was a change in my life i didn't necessarily have to burn everything down to the ground to hit my rock bottom yeah could you tell us about that what happened yeah, I, you know, Northern Westchester, growing up in high school, I think there was only one cop on duty at night. <laughs> and the last thing he really cared about was, or she, I, I don't know, um, was arresting 60 high schoolers at a house where there was no parents home. I mean, we, we partied. Um, I would show up with five of my buddies. Luckily, the only thing smart we ever did was have a designated driver. So that was the one thing we got right. <laughs> um, but I would show up my own bottle of vodka to a party. And pretty much everyone else would too. My high school parties were better than my college parties that I went to at West Virginia. So I started freshman year drinking. And we partied hard for the next four years, five years. So I got to West Virginia. And like I said, my father is an amazing person an amazing father and he provided the college experience where he actually paid for my college but the one thing he said was that you have to get good grades and that was the only agreement so i i took up i continued my path in, in high school into college and continued the drinking blah, blah blah and one morning i woke up and you know my roommate said that 
I got, you know, ascertained and, and you know, all these things. And I don't even remember it because I was so drunk. To this day, I still don't remember it. And try to I try to find it, but I, I can't. And that, at that point, it was kind of like this inflection point where it's like, where are you going? Like, what is this going to get in your life? And what do you want in this life? Because you going out and drinking isn't going to get you anywhere close to work what you want mm -hmm. so what what did you what did you do at that point like what did you did it feel really dark for you yeah it, it it really did um it put me in a place where I just acted and I picked up the pieces and I knew there was a lot of I knew my father was counting on me you know I was eight eight or nine hours away no one really knew what what happened um so I got to work and I was never smart in high school. I think I got like a 77 average graduating. Mm -hmm. West Virginia was the only school that accepted me. God bless them. That's and a partying school, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's like yeah. a wild it, it scene is. I've heard. <laughs> it there. is. And yeah, it's a catch 22 because they also have a great engineering program. Mm. Yeah. So I went there for that and got accepted luckily, but long story short is that I picked up the pieces and I was able to get a 3.9 GPA that first semester after doing terrible for the first exam or two. And then the second semester, I got a 4.0. And that Let me just ask me you something. So wait, you got arrested while you were there, right? Um, I, I wouldn't say arrested because I never actually went to a jail cell. Oh yeah. What happened? I, I, yeah. So I was told that like, I don't know. I was like in cuffs and got written up with the school and everything like that. And oh, because oh. I, because West Virginia has their own campus police, but they're actual cops of West Virginia, mm -hmm. they just basically threw me in my dorm room, you know, after and ripped me oh, up and, and gave me all the damages, but they never actually brought me to the police station. Got it. So I, I can't say arrested. Arrested would be the wrong word to say because I was never actually at, like mm -hmm. physically taken away. So yeah. let me take that time back. Yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, so you ended up, so you were written up and it was like, um, it was like a wake up call for you. Yeah. Community service and all that. I had to go to oh, court wow. appearance. Yeah. So what, what made you, so you ended up getting a 4-0 and what, mm -hmm. what was going on inside of you? No options. I got no nothing options. else. Left. Yeah, okay. Just. I have nothing else left. Like, this is the only thing I have going for me because I was in a place where I didn't know anybody. I wasn't going out partying. So I wasn't hanging out with my roommates and, and then my doormates around me. All I was doing was studying all day, every day. And but then you saw that as your only option. That's what you saw, right? Yeah. But you yeah. think about that. Yeah. You had other options. You could have went and partied and went and just crashed and burned more. But you took the option that you felt was the only option was success, which is interesting to me, was to pick your yourself up. Inter yeah, yeah. Right. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Like you're facing this big mountain sure. and that's what you did. Right. One test at a time, mm -hmm. one moment at a time. You did. You chose to be alone. That's a big decision. Don't you think? I remember. I do. I remember showing up to exams with so much mental pressure I put on myself to perform that I would start sweating it before I even got the test and just sitting down just out of like natural, like um, human fear, adrenaline, stress, these different things running through me um, just because I knew I had to get a 98 or above on that exam. I want to ask you about that because that's a big deal right there. That thing that would happen, that adrenaline, that fear, that, that whatever that is. So basically whenever we have that level of stress, stress is fear, right? So mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm like digging in. So if you want me to stop, just tell me <laughs> if you like, what were you ultimately afraid of? Because you, you had decided you were getting a 98 or above, but the alternative, think about what is the fear? I may not, if I don't get the 98, so what does it mean if I don't get that 98? It had a meaning to you. Mm -hmm. And what was and it? 
It's a very good question. I'm just saying, I hope that Bang wants to hire me to do, um, to uh, promote their drink. <laughs> just, I wanted a step, but okay, go ahead. Sorry. It was a moment. No, I, I think in that moment, right, when you get those, you know, primitive instincts coming up and those feelings, right, there is only a, one other thought that you cook up in your head. And it's really just the state of mind that you create in your own head. And that's the fear of death, right? Yeah. It's it's one of the pivotal feel or fears that hum, humans have, and it's the fear of death. So, you know, I, I didn't, I cooked up this idea that this is all I had. And I don't know why, I don't know how that became that powerful. But, Did it feel like you, you would know, die if you didn't get a 98? Quite frankly, in that moment, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And do you know what death would have looked like? I'm just curious. I just saw at that point in time, you know, a lot of it has to come back to like telling my father, I, I didn't do good enough. I came in second place. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I didn't honor my word. He honored his. I didn't honor mine. Where'd you learn all that? Hey, I didn't mean to do a therapy session, but I'm doing, I'm, I'm going. Okay. Yeah. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure where at this moment where that was birthed in me, but the idea that I needed to win, that I needed to succeed, that this is what needed needs to happen. And I'm going to give every single, every single little thing I possibly can and not want to live in regret. That probably stemmed from my history of racing go-karts. And since I was probably eight years old, I raced. And I got to the point where I was 15 or 16 and I had a triple crown. I ran, I won three national championships. And all I knew going into those races is that I had to win. Where did you learn that and you had to win? Do you know? Was it the community? You we, we were just competitive people. I mean, in today's society, right? Competition is, you know, is, is looked down upon in some respects, so like mm -hmm. being hyper competitive. And I'm not saying toxic, right? Where you yeah. want to hurt people. Because racing is this great environment where like mm -hmm. you get off the track and you guys are friends. But you get on that track, nothing else matters. That doesn't mean you hurt people. That doesn't mean any of this. But like it's literally like that saying, you're first or your last. Yeah, that's cool. You know what? It's I was wondering because I think there's so many aspects to what you're describing. And um as maybe some of some of the audience knows, like I grew up in the church, I raised my kids in the church, you know, I'm a I'm a person of faith. And I know that Patrick also is and that he grew up in, you know, in the church, right? Mm -hmm. So and I think that um, just kind of naturally what that can morph into is and I don't know if that happened for you, but it like naturally morphed into me that this kind of um, I would say fear for sure. Um, fear of failing, fear of making a mistake, feel of fear of not being like really like great, like doing what, you know, like what would Jesus do? <laughs> you know, like doing that, like being, you know, letting people down, like any of that stuff. And, and I think I've learned over time. I don't know if this has also impacted you. I'm just hearing it and it's reminding me of like my own you know, path. So I think that, you know, we, I had, um, I've always been high performance focus, you know, that kind of thing. But what I learned through, you know, just it's no one's fault in the church. I think that all of us in some ways became not all of us, a lot of us became a victim of it. Doesn't mean that anybody was even saying it, but it's like, um, you know, wanting ourselves to be the best we can be, but I think what we have grown up in is a risk, risk, yes, but also a mistake averse society. So that mistakes are seen as problems instead of opportunities for growth. 
and I'm hearing all in you, like, I hear that you take your mistakes as an opportunity for growth. But then when I hear that other part, that fear underneath, like that, oh my God, I cannot fail. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, do you feel what, when I'm saying this about the church, like, what do, what do you think about that? Does that relate to you at all? It, it, you know, the concepts of all of it absolutely do. And I have to be honest, I, I did grow up in the church and I would go to Sunday school growing up, but probably from the time that I was about eight to gosh, almost probably about eight months ago, I really lost my touch with faith and, and yeah. God. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't up until about eight months ago or six months ago um, that I got reconnected in, in, a, in a more meaningful way mm. as I'm finding every single day that the, the connections between my life and my faith mean the utmost to me. Um, but I think that, you know, where it really birthed in me, the idea that putting everything on the table, leaving nothing left and being there, this is your last living your life. Like this is your last day. Nothing else matters. Love that. It, and, and with that, it doesn't mean that you don't, nothing matters. It actually means that everything matters. Yeah. Everything matters. So when I was 16, I kind of had this huge problem for a couple of years and it really built up um, the f what happens when we die, right? Now, remember, this was at a point where I really wasn't in touch with faith, so I didn't have any of that. What what happens when I die? And it's gone. I mean, every everything, it's just blackness, right? That's what I had cooked up in my head. And I didn't really know how to deal with it for a little bit. And then I got to the point after, I don't know what the, how this idea just came about in my head, but it, it gave me peace. And that's that I'm going to live my life where every single day I make the most of it. I put my best foot forward. I leave it all on the table and there's nothing left in the gas tank. And that is the only way that I truly found at that point in time. And quite frankly, I still live like that, that if I die tomorrow, everything's okay. Because I know at least the day that day I gave it my all and there's nothing left that I can do. I'll tell you something like um, one of the reasons I know that you're such a great guest is because I feel that like those feelings of tears in my eyes, you know, like I feel like what you're saying has so much meaning and there's so many aspects of what you're saying that have meaning, but you know, you bring up the concept of death and, um, you know, Ed mylett has been bringing that up a lot that, you know, and also, um, what is his name? Robin, uh, what is his name? Charmed? What the heck is his name? It, he's a famous guy. I can't even think of it now, but basically they talk about being aware that we, we are, we're going to die. And that, you know, even Tony Watley, he talks about that, like, like, you know, we don't know what our next, we don't know when we're going to die. And I've had that experience of just losing my husband. So it's like this, it, it can be very, very frightening that it's like an existential crisis. I, I have waves of that that happen to me where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, like I, it's almost like I can feel it. It's like a wave, like, oh my God, what am I doing here? And it feels frightening, you know, like, because, you know, but one of the things I think, and is incredible about having faith because faith creates, I believe, I believe that what we believe we create and, and, um, the, you having, 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 knowing that energy can neither be, um, it can't be created or destroyed that we, we go from life to life. And that I, I, I always think of death in this way is that you know how like a baby in a mother's womb is like when they're about to be born, they're petrified. You know, they, they're, they, everything that they know is stopping and it hurts. It physically hurts them because they're being squeezed and pushed like through this like horrifying dark place and going into this bright place where they, they're not breathing the same way. They're not any, any security that they had is gone everything that they knew is over. And if it was up to them, they would stay there forever. And I almost see us like that, that like we're in this state, we're in this 3D world, we're in so much psychology 
has proven and science has proven that we are so dumbed down, our five senses slow down information so much that everything that we're getting is so limited that we are actually, we've put so much stock in what we see, touch, feel, and all of that. And all of it is like not the real, real thing. The real, real thing is what we don't see. There's so much information coming out us that's being filtered out that we don't see. So I don't know how I trailed off on that, but basically what you talking about leaving it all on the table and, and um, like when I picture you frightened to death and I, I, I pick that up in you, I swear, I pick up on you like this and you're intense, Patrick, holy, I'm not going to curse, but holy that. He's intense, but you see, and there's something else about you. You did a thing just before you said, I, you know, you say things like I didn't have a choice. You said, um, you know, all I had left was to do this thing, but it's not, and I'm repeating it again. You said it again, but no, you could most, most people, a lot of people, especially young crash and burn. They keep going because they see no hope. And I think that you watched your father, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, I think I lost you. You watched your dad. Yes. You watched your dad drive and create a business. Think about it. He's your role model, right? So yes. how much, yes. How much influence does what he, his drive have over you? And, and, and an immense amount and who he is as a person, his character. And that's actually, you know, as we all develop in the life, you know, that's, we all create kind of different boundaries and that's kind of where I'm at right now um, at different boundaries. But my father's influence on me, it, I mean, my father is the hardest working person in the room, all right? My dad was the type of entrepreneur that was out of the house at seven and, he was making phone calls in his truck at eight o'clock at night. I mean, I, I vividly remember the sun coming down in the summer and just waiting for him to get off the phone to say hi. Mm -hmm. And I've already eaten dinner. It's dark. It's getting dark out. And there was nights growing up where like, I didn't see my father really Monday through Friday because he was taking care of business. And I understood that though, because on the weekends, he gave me his time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't mm -hmm. loveless, but he, he created a life for us a life where my mom was able to stay at home, you know, and take care of us and be the best mother ever, you know, where we didn't really have to, you know, worry about our needs because we had everything we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so my father as a role model, I mean, he's been everything for me growing up. He's literally shaped who I am today as a person and why I want to actually create such a life for my children. That's part of the reason why I work so hard for my future family. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. So it's like, almost like what you're doing today is for your future self as well. Yeah. I mean, listen, I grew up, I'm, I'm in Northern Westchester, mm -hmm. like taxes to my parents' property. I think it was like $35,000 a year. Like I don't live in a cheap area. My dad, as stereotypical as it is, he's a contractor right? I mean, like most contractors don't make that much money. We went racing, me and my brother. I have a brother. We, our last year of racing, we, I think my dad said he spent like $120,000 that year. And this isn't about- Wait, On racing? About, on the yeah, racing? racing? Racing alone. So this isn't about to talk about how much money my father made. It's about to talk about the actual life he gave us because that 120 grand bought us three and four day weekends with him where we were driving down to Florida over the Indiana, South Carolina and getting amazing family time and doing something that my friends back in high school just couldn't conceive. Yeah. It's, and it's unique. And it's like, and, it, and you know, the thing that's interesting, what you were saying about it is that you said something about comp um, about competition. I wish I could remember mm -hmm. it. I'm sure you'll repeat it, but like the concept that it creates you know, when we, when we show up for ourselves and we um, do the thing that we promise ourselves that we'll do, it creates confidence. 
you know, and you, you laying it all out on the table and making sure that you win. I believe that if you, if you decide to do something, not you, all of us, if we decide to do something, we it's done. Maybe not this first time, but it's happening because you've made it. You, if you, that decision is an incredible power move. And I just, you have this, this decision power in you, I see, right? You see it. I'm just saying it out loud. I think maybe when I say it, you know that it's true. Isn't it true? <laughs> I mean, people, people are always going to talk about, you know, now that I'm in shape and I, I try hard, right? I mean, like, oh, like, how do you do it? You know, what, what's the trick and all that stuff? Like, there is no tricks. You just decide, like you said. It's that I meal prep for seven days of the week. Yes, I eat out of a glass Tupperware seven days of the week, mm -hmm. except for maybe Sundays because mm -hmm. I don't have, I have more time. And the, uh, at the like, Arate oh, meetup. We force yeah, you yeah, to eat like, well, yeah. Well, you know. And when Chris orders for you. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, that's a good yeah. story. But, you know, I mean, oh, yeah, no, I won't say it out loud. But, okay. But, yeah, this, but it's, it's yeah. really just deciding, like you said, right? Because, you know, you can go home and decide you're going to have four beers or you can decide to respect yourself. I love that. Elaborate on that, please. You know why I'm asking you to elaborate? Because there's somebody out there that probably needs to hear that. Yeah. I mean, the idea that we should just respect ourselves as humans, right? And there's a happy balance in life between, you know, our vices and what we need to do to take care of ourselves. But if, you know, the, the idea of short-term pleasure versus the long-term happiness, that's where you're really getting into is having two or three, four beers every single night or, or five days of the week going to bring you that long-term happiness. And then you're at the gym that you go to three days a week complaining about how you can't take, you know, lose the weight. It's, it's just a decision though. And what are you deciding? You're deciding the simple pleasure in front of you for the long-term pain. But most people, they don't, they're not, they don't want to make that decision. And it's really just as easy as making a decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not perfect. I still have ways to go. I still have my vices in life that I need to work on. I have, I have my vices just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. And once you get to a certain point and you get to the next level, you realize there's another, there's a whole nother 10 levels beyond that. There's another mountain. There's another peak that we need to continue to develop ourselves to get there. Some of it is asking the right questions, but once you, most of us already have the, the information inside of us, we just need to make the decision to actually take action. No, I'll tell you something. The thing, the thing that you're describing is, you know, it's like a few, a few of the things that are in my book. Like I have a chapter in my book about that, the, that a decision is a power move. And then another one is about, um, uh, incremental change. And then another one is about staying like the power of staying. And I think about, you know, like Will Smith says, and forget about Will Smith smacking someone. I don't even care about that. I'm just saying like, he's, he's succeeded in a lot of areas of his life. And one of the, he was asked, you know, how, um, how did you do all the things that you've done? He said, I just decided. And there's a, there's a thing that happens in our brain neurologically. When we make a decision, um, our brain is a goal-driven machine. And once the decision is made, everything in our brain um, in regard to other decisions, the neuron clusters that are firing, they stop firing and they only fire for that one decision. And um, then our eyes, our ears, all of our senses are drawn toward everything to support that decision. And basically it's, it's scientifically backed up that that's true. And, and I think that our mindset, if we have a mindset that life is a struggle, that life is, you know, you have to, you know, work so hard and all this stuff. Well, that then you're going to have to, but if you believe that the moment that you're in, if we stay in the moment that we're in and we do the thing in that moment, and every time we do, we advance and we stay aligned with the future that we want to be, whatever it is, the greatness that we want, every moment pivots back towards aligning with the future person that you will be because you've decided you cannot lose. It's not even possible. 
So it's like, you know, even you have little pivots, you know, we, I mean, we all screw up. There's a, there's a message though, because we're going to wrap up and I want it. There's a message from you that I want other people to hear, because I know that when people listen to things like this, they'll be like, oh yeah, well, I had a shitty childhood or, oh yeah, well, look, you know, this guy, you know, grew up with, you know, great things, whatever. Uh, I want to clear that up. First of all, I want to hear from you and I want to just say something about it. I had a shitty childhood <laughs> but, and I was neglected and, I ha and I've had a lot of trauma in my life, but the thing about, the thing about um, Patrick is that when you look at him, the fact that he has done it and the decisions he's made tells you that you can do it. And it doesn't matter where you are today. That doesn't, none of that matters. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't, you know, if you're looking right now at everything, all the reasons why you don't match or you can't be, you know, you can't do what Patrick did or what I've done, your, your perspective is in the wrong spot because all we have to, you just have to think in your mind, create the person that you would love to be because just like the apple tree that has a li the little seed, the, all that information in it. Like if somebody said this in my book too, I'm, I'm, I, I learned from Chris Warren's that you have to plug your damn book. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing it. So this little apple seed that's in there that it has all this information. And if, if anyone looked or the apple seed, someone said to the apple seed, oh, you, you're going to be 20 feet tall and you're going to produce food for hundreds of years to come. It would be like, that's not possible. And everybody around that seed would think that too. So it's really like you want to envision exactly who you want to be, what you want to have, how you want to be, how you want to show up. Because when you do that, if that vision is inside of you, then it's, it's meant to happen. If that's your spark. So if you ho hold on to that vision, that's my favorite quote. I lay hold. Um, I lay hold of, wait, oh my God. I say this quote all the time. Um, I lay hold of my vision. Obstacles must give way. It's my favorite quote ever by Napoleon Bonaparte, but I feel like I want you guys to just know that. So when you're listening to Patrick, you, you, you look at him and you say, I can be him and I can be, I can do the things that he's done to get where I want to go. So Patrick, what do you, what would you say to someone about uh, someone who's like beating themselves up when they're listening to you? It is so hard to pick apart the story we tell ourselves when we're alone in a room at night and from the actual reality of what's surrounding us. Yes. Keeping that vision of who you want to be, where you want to go, and what you want to do in this world is the only thing that's going to help you get there. Because if you focus on what your life looks like right now, and what obstacles you have and what you're surrounded with, you're never going to get out of it. Because quite frankly, I've set goals where I want to be at. And I was speaking to someone, I was speaking to Chris actually, Chris Warrens. And he was like, and I said, well, that means I have to do X, Y, Z in five years. And he's always, you're selling yourself short of how much growth you can go through in five years. So don't limit yourself just because you have a dream to be financially independent in 10 years or whatever it may be. You have to focus on that vision and live that every single day if you want to achieve it. You know, and, and like, this, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. You know, but what you, what you um, also from just knowing you also, I feel like no matter what goodness you've had in your life, you know, any opportunities, you, um, I think some of your personal struggle has been your own perception of self, right? Wouldn't you say? Everything serves us in this world 
mm -hmm. until it no longer does. I've gone to right here because of the beliefs that I've had. But now I'm starting to believe, I'm starting to find that those beliefs are actually limiting me. Yeah. What, what beliefs are they? <laughs> For example, my idea that I need to work, you know, my butt off and everything has to be perfect. And my, you know, nothing can, you know, not to trust people because I'm a, a fear of losing my integrity, like that, you know, just everything has to be done with my hand and the fear of someone else stepping in there and making it less than perfect uh, or less than my standards that I want to give to customers, right? That sharing some, all, giving people some autonomy and some trust. That's, it would, it served me amazingly going through college. It serves you tremendously when you're working for somebody. But when you're trying to build a team or you're trying to build, you're trying to get to that big vision, that big vision of a team that I really have for my company of serving people, some cu customers, the, the volume that I want to hit to be able to spread this vision. I need to, I need to forget that those beliefs and move on and turn the page. You know, that right there was such a game changer for me because it's so hard when you're, you have like a high level, um, uh, I guess, uh, what would the word be? Like, um, I, I I have a certain level of excellence that I expect things Standards. to be delivered in, yes. And when, you know, you when you have to turn it over and trust someone else to do that high level thing, it can feel so crazy. It, it took a lot for me to start working on my business instead of in the business. You know, that's a, such a big, big move, but you can't give on a massive level if you don't do that. So, and it's also, it's also, you know, I, I, I'm not referring this to you, but to myself, there's a selfishness involved in being the only one who can do things instead of sharing the wealth of knowledge and taking the time to really train other people to be great. And then, you know, like spread what we have to people who can, can actually do it. And that takes mm -hmm. time, you know? So I think that that's, um, it's good. And I, I feel like there is, I don't think there's any entrepreneur who hasn't had that struggle and the surest way to kill, um, any business is to keep, you know, all you're doing is, you know, um, you created a job for yourself instead of creating, uh, you know, um, jobs for many. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, really what you would be doing, it's the American dream is being such an excellent person at what you do and then providing an opportunity for other people of excellence to do what you do, Patrick, is your create your chain. I mean, I'm be, I, I don't think I'm being dramatic. I mean, I am dramatic some in some ways, but I feel like if we're really going to cast a big vision, we want to change our country. Right. So we want to bring standards back that are that are of very high level of excellence. So you will weed out people who don't want to work and you will have people of people of excellence and you will provide jobs for excellence. And that's a big deal because in the contracting business, as you know, is the reputation is these guys don't show up. <laughs> they all whatever. What's wrong with these freaking guys? You know, but you know, you show up you know, just the way you are, you're a person of integrity. I mean, I'm sure everybody can see that, but that's a big deal. That's no small, you know, and it would be selfish of you to just keep swinging a hammer, Mr. Patrick. Yeah. You agree? Yeah, I, I would agree. And why would I limit, you know, the service that I can give to people to transform their homes, to create a new environment for them and their families to share memories and you know why would i limit it to four or five six people a year when i could do that for 20 families 30 families and 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 along with that provide the experience that's headache free that you know brings some certainty back into construction where you know you know when guys are going to show up and and god forbid they don't you know that they're not going to show up too because mm -hmm. something's something's come up in this world but at least 
you know that's not you know at least you know what's coming down the pipeline yeah and you know what you're going into people's homes where their families are and everything but you know what i think what you're doing is you're 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 not just you know doing a job you're ha- you're creating relationships and having um you know an ad and that's what this is what arate is all about really this is what all of us are wanting to do is we want to have meaning to what we're doing and we want and we all have a mission you know we're we're like a movement you know i'm a mental health movement we're not an agency we're we're changing the face of mental health so it's like that's the same thing you're changing the face of construction but it's not through like trying to market and get more people. It's through creating life and re- life-giving relationships through our work, right? If Drop I can't call up my, you know, All right. if I can't call up my customer when the job's all done two months later and just see what's up in their life to see how they're doing as a friend or go out and grab some lunch with them, I didn't do my job well enough. I should be able to be friends with my customers at the end of the job. It's not transactional. I agree. I agree. You know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to leave us with this one Napoleon Hill quote. It just came to me, but I, I live my life by it. Everybody here who works for me knows this. And I say it all the time. I say it to my employees is that um, I do not engage in any transaction that is not of benefit to everyone involved. And it's like, Mm -hmm. and he says that in his book and I just, it just resonates with me. So even like whatever it is, giving somebody more money, I make sure that every, it's not like everybody benefits from the things that we do and we can do that. So listen, I just want to thank you so much, Patrick, for being on this show. And I want to just ask um, you is, are there places we're going to put it in the session, in the notes, but like, um, where can people reach you? And if somebody, you know, if people want, you know, to use you for their construction or they want to, who knows? I mean, who knows? Maybe there's a chick out there that really wants you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it, you never know. Like, I mean, there's a good chance. Wow. A lot of chicks on yeah. here. All right. I'm sorry I called you chicks. No haters, please. I'll just erase your comments because I never keep them. But anyhow, um, tell. <laughs> it's true. I don't care. Um, so t- so where can people reach you? Yeah, so my company's website is momentousbuilding.com. I'm sure you're going to put in the show notes. And then mm-hmm. my Instagram's uh, projectpatrick96. Um, that, those are probably the two best places to reach out to me if you want to connect. Um, I have a Facebook page too for my company. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm an open person. I always take a phone call. Um, yeah, or shoot me a direct message. Yeah, Easy. I love that. I love that about you. All right. So Patrick, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. You were absolutely wonderful. You almost made me cry like five times. Did you know that? Thank you so much. No, I did not. Thank you so much for having me, Austin. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you.